Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this is Deep Merhi. I'm one of I'm the organizer for this SKC Science and Technology webinar series. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. Today, I'm uh, really glad to have John Heidemann uh, from University of Southern California. Uh, I know John for a long time, actually, he has done amazing research in uh, uh, computer networking over almost a quarter century. And Jen agreed to give this talk, uh, you know, about uh, how to actually observe the global internet, what actually is happening. And he has been doing it since 2014. And John is originally from uh, uh, Nebraska. You know, he went to University of Nebraska at Lincoln where he did undergraduate. And then he did his PhD from University of California at Los Angeles. And I believe he has been at the uh, USC Information Science Institute uh, since, um, about after you done that, right? It's been a while. Uh, since so, then, yeah, since great. 95, it's and been so, a long time. And again, uh, just to kind of tell everybody that I we do it like a fireside chat, we call it. So you can ask questions at any time. Uh, usually one obviously want to mute yourself during the, during the, um, during the, you know, presentation, but you can ask questions anytime. I will also ask questions, you know, when I see something, you know, uh, because I'm a bit familiar with this topic. So, and I believe with that, uh, I'll let uh, John get going, so. Yeah, thank you, Deep. Um, so, and just, I think if you raise your hands or something, uh, let's see, like that. Oh, yep. I, mean, I don't know how to put it down though. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's, uh, I don't oh, think I, I can pull it down. So. You'll put it down for me. Anyway, see, I, I I'm already know, so messed I'm up. Just, I'm just saying that I do not know how to put it down. So. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so, okay. Oh, here it is, lower hand. Um, okay. And then, uh, and Deep, you'll help me. If, if somebody raises a hand and I don't notice it, uh, let me know, because like you guys are over here and my screen's over here, so. That's fine, um, perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. uh, so hi, folks. Uh, I can't see any of you, but uh, thank you for joining me uh, this afternoon, I guess, your time. Um, uh, I'm going to be talking to you about what we've been doing to observe the global internet. And this is work spanning the last eight years or so um, of many folks at USC. Um, I'd like to particularly point out Lin Kwan, who is the grad student who got it started, and Yuri Prodkin, uh, who else? Uh, Guillermo Balcha, Asma Anyet are currently working on the problem. So. Uh, lots of interesting stuff. Oh, and Xiao Song. Um, so uh, the internet's important. We all know this, right? We know how much we spend on the internet. We know how much time we spend on the internet. Um, and we know how there are certain things that you can only do on the internet today. And so this is a screenshot, you know, class registration is only on the internet at my university these days. So we really want the internet to keep working. Um, but the world is also important. And so uh, I think what I want to show you, if I may, is an animation onto my website. And you can actually go to this link, uh, outage.ant.isi.edu, if you want. But let me show you it, if I find the play button. So Hurricane Harvey, this is Texas, which is in the south of the United States. Hurricane Harvey hit the Texas coast in 2017. And this picture graphs network outages. So each circle is uh, a number of networks in an area. The size of the circle is the, is the number of networks that are out and the color is the percentage of networks that are out. And so what you'll see is as the hurricane moves ashore, there's of course wind and flooding. So and your gray area is actually the Bay of Mexico. Oh, yes, right? I'm sorry. The Bay area is the, this is the Gulf of Mexico. Gulf of and Mexico. the black area is the land in Texas. Correct. Mm -hmm. um, and so what you can see when the hurricane makes land, you see these white areas, which correspond to 50% of the networks in those areas are out. And those are actually rural areas in Texas, you know, where their internet is vulnerable to power outages and, and um, downed power lines and stuff. But we can kind of watch this and see the, the thing evolve. And I don't know if I can't see because Zoom is hiding it, but you can actually see the time up there and all this. And uh, let me see if I, I'm not going to do it today, but if we play this long enough, uh, Hurricane Harvey actually hung out for 
a couple of days over Texas, <laughs> and it actually moved out over the ocean and gathered more strength and ended up flooding in Houston. And so if we were patient enough, we could watch some of these outages get fixed when they fix the utility crews, when they roll utility crews. But then we'll see actually there is a lot of flooding and, and we'll see the circles in Houston get bigger a couple of days later. So uh, exactly John, what does those circles mean and the colors? Maybe you can- Yeah, so the, the colors are in this scale over here, the percentage of networks, and we break the, the world up into geographic grid cells. So I think each grid cell here is a half degree by a half degree latitude longitude. And we geolocate all the IPv4 blocks that we can measure in that grid cell, in that latitude longitude region, and then we count them. And so I don't have a scale. There is an actual scale. I just don't have it on the screen. Um, so, you know, this might represent 10,000 networks that are out. And because it's pink, this represents 50% of the networks in that grid cell. Does that make sense? So okay. remind me again, what's the size of the grid you have? Uh, I think it's a half degree by half degree here. So um, half degree is how many miles? So you do know? That? I don't know. Okay, um, maybe somebody on the chat will tell us. Yes, remember. perhaps yes. so. You know. <laughs> okay. Good. This is like uh, what fifth, like a hundred kilometers or something. That's something, correct. You know? mm -hmm. this, is, okay. this is not a small area. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and and fifty percent of the networks being down is not a small outage either, right? This we don't exactly. see this very often. Um, and you know, for these cities, so Corpus Christi is a pretty big city and Houston is a gigantic city, many million people. Um, you know, Houston has a between a zero and 10% outage right now, but that still represents thousands of people without internet. So anyway, so this is real data that we collected using our measurement system. And I'm gonna tell you how we get this data in just a minute. But this shows you the goal of our work, which is to be able not only to understand the internet and how important that is, but to hopefully understand something about the real world. So, and we actually have a question to uh, Tuika. Are you going to tell us how big a, a degree is, or half a degree is? Or maybe you have another question. Or you're so offended that I mispronounced your name so badly. Okay. Okay, or maybe you accidentally put your hand up. There are many options. Okay. But I'll push on. Oh, somebody tells me, somebody sent me a link, but I'm yeah. not going to follow a link right now. But right. Um, you guys can follow along at home. Anyway, so that was Texas. Um, and in fact, I went and looked. Oh, 70 miles. Thank you. Um, I actually went and looked at some of the Indian cyclones that hit. You had two big ones recently. And oh, goodness, I'm not going to get these right. But Joss was one. And uh, there was a T1 that hit the West Coast. Um, Joss hit like the East Coast. And the, anyway, they actually didn't show up in our data. And maybe we'll talk more at the end of this talk. And maybe you guys can help me figure that out because um, I'd love to know more about the Indian networking and why, why uh, we have these beautiful data for Texas, but not, not for India. But I do have some Indian data for India that I'll show later. Anyway, so uh, that was hurricanes. And we spent a lot of time on hurricanes, but there's lots of things that happen in the world. So Texas is an unlucky state recently. They actually had power outages um, due to a cold snap. It never freezes in Texas except a, a raise rarely. And they had a cold snap and they lost their power grid. Um, and so their power grid losses also show up in our data. So this is a visualization of the same thing. And then, uh, of course, coronavirus. We all have heard of that. Um, I actually have a new research effort that that uh, Deep is aware of that um, is trying to use the data that we collected in the outage work to look for evidence of work from home. And I'll talk about that much later in this talk. So I won't say more about that now, but the high order bit is we can actually see people stay at home. Um, so we hope people are healthy and staying at home. Um, and then the final thing is a little bit more depressing perhaps, but not only does nature throw us curves, but humans throw ourselves curves, right? So Myanmar had a coup um, at the beginning of 2020, I think, and that showed up in our data. 
Um, it's not as obvious, but you can see this red circle here. Myan um, Myanmar doesn't have that many networks, and a lot of their networks lost. That's, that's not too far from Assam, John. So it no, it's not far from Assam. <laughs> um, anyway, so you may know more about what happened to Myanmar than I do. Um, uh, and then the other thing, this this is a, on the other side of India. <laughs> Uh, Iraq actually had exams, and to prevent cheating, they actually shut down their internet during exams. And so we could see this nice square tooth wave five days in a row while they take exams for three hours every morning. Um, and that's this red dot in this picture here. And it's not just Iraq. We also see the same thing in Sudan and uh, a couple of other countries. So not only nature, natural disasters, we can see human interference with the internet as well. And so this really matters, right? We'd like to know what this is. And it doesn't just matter about bad things, but it also matters about good things because lots of CDNs um, are trying to decide where to serve customers. And that's the kind of information that comes out of this kind of network measurement as well. And in fact, uh, in the United States, at least, just yesterday, Akamai had an outage. Mm -hmm. uh, and two weeks, two weeks, three weeks ago, Fastly had an outage. Those are both CDNs. Yeah. And so, so a bunch of websites For the audience, CDN is the oh. distribution <laughs> network. You know, those are basically closer to the users or the customers. And there are big companies like Akamai and Fastly, you know, hit they, are, they have footprint all over the world pretty much. So, and yeah, so thank you. they go down the end user or customers don't get that information. So that's and they, they provide all the data behind our websites. Important. So exactly. um, I think some mm -hmm. Australian banks went offline when Akamai went down uh, yesterday. And you know, you wouldn't think, you know, first, who knows what Akamai is, right? Not only us geeks know, but um, but it really has a big impact. So um, anyway, so that's the problem. Um, oh, and then there's one other bit. So this is actually research from a colleague of mine at um, uh, uh, Paul Barford. This is the physical network infrastructure. These are where the cables are in the dirt in the United States. You can actually see the shape of the United States. Um, one thing we'd like to understand is a, a risk with this, as you can see, like this is Denver here in the middle of the country, or you can see here's probably Kansas City in the, in the other middle of the country. <laughs> That's correct, right? And you can see there's a bunch of cables that go right through this city. And if we if we blew up Kansas City, which we won't do, but um, you know, it would be a problem. We'd have a bunch of failures, right? And so it turns out we actually can see these kind of failures. And I'll ex hopefully get to that in this talk if I get moving. So let me get moving. Um, so let me talk about what we do and how we do it. So. Before I do that, I need to give a little tutorial on what the internet looks like. So this is my picture of the internet. Um, and this is actually reasonably recent data, I think. I can't, oh, I can't see 27. No, that's not right. Oh, it says uh, 2020. This is uh, year old data. Um, so the internet is IP addresses, right? And IP addresses you've probably seen like 1.2.3.4 or 192.0.2.1. So there's two things you need to know for this talk. One is that there's 4 billion. These are IPv4 addresses. I'm not going to talk about IPv6 in this talk for the most part. For IP, IPv4 is what most people use. There's 4 billion IPv4 addresses. So, you know, it's 32 bits numbered from 0 .0 .0 .0 0.0.0.0 to 255.255.255.255. Okay. First thing. Second thing is when we give out IP addresses, we give them out in blocks. And blocks can be different sizes, you know, depending on how big your ISP is. Um, I was actually looking at uh, the Indian telco this morning. Oh, I'm blanking. N B L C. Anyway, you you guys will know what it is. Um, they have many many IP addresses. <laughs> anyway, when we talk about an IP address block, uh, we talk about slash a slash number, right? So we can take a 32-bit IP address 192.0.2.1. And if we talk about the slash 16, that means we, we're just talking about the top 16 bits and everything that's under those 16 bits. So 16 bits is six, two to the 16 is 65,000 addresses. So if I say 192.0 slash 16, that's the 65,000 addresses that start at 192.0.0.0 and go up 
to 192.0.255.255. Okay, so this matters because what we actually track for outages are blocks, not individual IP addresses, because if I, I'm not gonna suspend my laptop, but if I suspend my laptop, that address will go away, right? That'll stop responding. And so now I can explain this picture to you, which is this is the IPv4 space, meaning we start from 0.0.0, .0, .0 and number to 255.255, which is up in this corner. Yeah, you can see my mouse, right? I think so. Um, and I can because, see my mouse. Mm -hmm. You can see my mouse, okay. Because if we drew that on a line, it would be really long and obnoxious and thin we draw it with a, a Hilbert curve, which is a fractal. You can see the Hilbert curve down here. It basically snakes around in this really obnoxious, complicated pattern of squares. Uh, you don't need to worry about those details, but the important thing is that adjacent addresses, meaning address blocks, in other words, turn into squares in this map. And you can actually see that. You can so, completely John, see that. got a quick question for you, sure. the Hilbert curve. What made you to think about representing all these addresses, you know, uh, sort mm -hmm. of in this kind of a rectangular thing, but smaller, different size one, because size of each block is different, yeah. right? What made you to think about using something like <laughs> Hilbert curve? Right? Oh, that's a good question. So it turns out there was a comic, XKCD, which you may have seen, um, and they uh, <laughs> scooped my research. <laughs> So we were playing with Hilbert curves, but um, they published their comic before Randall Monroe is the author, artist. He's very geeky and very smart and does lots of cool things. He published a map of the internet that looks exactly like this, which is a Hilbert curve, uh, like two months before I published my map. So uh, we have to credit him with the idea. But um, basically Hilbert curves is the space filling curve that and the neat thing is, I can't show it to you now. I can I can show it to you now. Let me show you uh, through the power of the web. Um, we have our Hilbert curve data. On the web, of course. So this is the most recent data that we have. Sorry, while it loads. Oh, that's not right. How did that happen? That is completely the wrong data. Oh, I see, I did outage browse. See, Deep is tricking me into doing live demos and see what happens. So this is actually helpful. So this is the same map that you just saw, but this lets me show how you zoom in, right? So basically these squares correspond to blocks uh, and you can do this at home if you go to ant slash address slash browse, which you can see in the menu here in the year. But if I zoom in far enough, you can see how it gets bigger. So the neat thing about a Hilbert curve is it's fractal. So as we zoom in, we can show more detail and it all just scales. Um, you may have seen fractals with, uh, what's what the Mandelbrot set is the most famous fractal. But uh, since I took you here, I'll show you my university, uh, isi.edu. And I'm showing you this because we left graffiti in the map. Uh, this is my computers and stuff. Oh no, it doesn't show up. Oh, darn it. Just a second. We must have lost our server. I'm paging through time to look at old data sets. Oh, see, it's the live demo curse. Okay, I will give up on this now. Anyway, so the point is you zoom in and you can see these features and these blocks, like this is a slash 16. Um, I'm sorry, this is a slash 24. This is 256 IP addresses. Um, I'm really mad I can't see my graffiti. Okay, well, I'll have to show it to you later. Anyway, so this is where I'm from and, and you can zoom in and zoom out and all that stuff. But I'm getting way ahead, way abroad, way afield, showing you pretty toys. The important thing to know is that there's these things called blocks and that's what we're looking for. And now Zoom is blocking my display, just a minute. Okay, so the other thing I'll show you just as one last bit of eye candy. Um, you just saw me zoom in in the web browser to the real internet. We actually printed the internet out. This is hanging in the wall outside my office. And if you print it out 
at 600 dots per inch, which is smaller than your eye can see without a magnifying glass, it's about two, three meters by three meters. So it's uh, big. The internet is big. I think we can all agree to that. Um, and so it looks kind of cool when you print it out. OK, but let's get back to the research at hand and, and what we're doing. So this is another view of the internet, um, which is, uh, OK. So in this case, I'm showing you a graph of part of the internet over time. So this is one block, 256 addresses, and each address is a row of this data. And then each column is a particular observation. And we're probing all addresses all the time here. And so what you can see is there's green dots. Oh, I didn't explain that on the prior graph. I'm sorry. The green dots mean response, means we probe an address and a computer responds and says, I'm here. A black dot means no response. John, and I so, have one quick question going back yeah. to the previous picture. Somebody asked that uh, what about color coding of those picture? What's yeah, that? exactly. That's what I was just back backfilling okay. for you. Okay, good. So That's the fine. green dots are responsiveness, right? So ah, the, the okay. greener areas are more responsive and the blacker areas are not responsive at all. So, like, so this is a one snapshot at a particular point. So this is time. one snapshot from 2020 04, uh, uh -huh. January, March, April. Mm -hmm. um, this is a snapshot from a long time ago, 2011, um, just when the internet was full. The IPv4 was fully allocated. Um, and this is data from, I don't remember when, but mm -hmm. anyway, does that make sense? Yep. So uh, John will talk about how he actually checks if the network is up. Or yes, th not that's up. what I'm getting to. How, how do we tell the network failed? Yep. So I was looking at this data with my student and there's this anomaly in the middle of this block, right? And this line, this vertical line. And so we thought, oh, clearly your software screwed up. Please go fix it, right? But um, we actually looked at some other blocks and this is a different block and this is a third block. And what you can see is um, the same phenomena shows up in this other block and then it shows up in this third block in a different place, right? And then you start to really wonder what's going on, right? Is this a our, our bug or is maybe our bug is systematic or maybe this is something else. And these are network outages. This, this from drawing those pretty pictures, and scanning the whole IPv4 internet, we realized buried in our data is evidence of network problems and network outages. And so uh, I want to tell you how we convert the raw data into this evidence and to evidence that we can stand behind scientifically. So the challenge is a ping is ambiguous. If I, you, you may have run a ping, the ping command on your computers, but it sends a packet to an IP address and it waits for a reply and most of the time people don't reply. <laughs> and people don't reply for a whole bunch of reasons, right? Maybe there's no computer there or maybe they suspended their laptop or maybe they have a firewall up and don't wanna to talk to us. All those stuff are reasons. And so if you're looking at a block, you have to realize you have ambiguous signals. So if we probe an address and I've simplified this to just four addresses in this block for, for now, if you probe somebody and get a positive response, a green dot, that means that address replied and we know the block is up because we got a reply from it, okay? And as we probe over time, we get different responses, but as long as somebody responds, we know the block is up. We've proven that we can get to that part of the internet from wherever we are. Okay, John, let me kind of quickly add and you sure. can elaborate on it that uh, when, when John talks about probing something, you know, he talked about these blocks of addresses all over the world, right? And he has a program running on his computer, which is mm -hmm. job is just, it's just scanning the internet every 11 minutes. Is that right? Uh, yep. And it just goes out to the wall so today, hey, is this address block available? And it goes through but, all the addresses. Uh, it goes to all of the addresses and collects the data. If it is responding, that means send, but like I almost saying that, you know, you're calling a friend and that friend doesn't pick up. That means something happened. If or you're like you're walking down the street and knocking on each door. Right, exactly. That's even better analogy. You knocked it and somebody opened, somebody did not open. Except if we won't do that during COVID. Yeah. So, uh, and if you don't open the door, that's basically a black dot, you know, or, and then you can change to different colors if that, okay, it oh, it opened the door now, but 11 minutes later, it did not maybe. And but 11 yeah. minutes later, it again did, you know, kind of going, you know, so it'd be like this on. kind of thing. So that can happen. 
So, yeah. and this is done to a program called a ping command. Ping goes mm -hmm. back to my early days of internet, you know, which is 35 years back, right? And I, who would have known that a tool like that would be so useful to yeah. kind of scan and know something about it. And hopefully that sort of answers Mohit's question. Yeah, thank you if very not, much for you can ask that. again later. So, and, yes. and I should say, uh, we actually, so the question about responsive, responsive means we send a ping to you and your computer replies to us. And we use ping for a special reason, which is it's very innocuous. <laughs> very little bad can happen from a ping. Um, it's a commonly used diagnosis tool that you all have on your computer. Um, and we do this because we've been probing the entire internet for more than 10 years. And I'll tell you, when you do that, people get mad at you. And some of them are very vocal about it. <laughs> but we'll save those stories for later because I've told too many stories already. Um, anyway uh so this is the signal that we're looking at right and what we're seeing and then that black bar corresponds to all the addresses that you some of which used to respond to all of a sudden being non-responsive so that's what i was showing you on that prior visualization okay so and the key one of the key insights in our outage detection is we don't do outage detection for individual ip addresses because they change uh, but we do outage detection for blocks. And we specifically look at slash 24 blocks, so 256 adjacent IP addresses. And uh, it's always, that happens to be the smallest unit that they can send on, that they can route on the internet. So there's some reasons why we pick that number, but, but so those let's are more go detailed. back to John's analogy of the knocking on the door. Mm -hmm. What it means that behind the door, like a house, there are many people maybe living five or 10. That's your address block, basically. Yeah. You know, group, group of people. You're not checking that if all of the people in the house is there. You're just saying that somebody is there. That's yeah. all John is doing. Instead of checking against pinging each computer on the, you know, that'll be to whatever, two to yeah. 32 sort of a situation. We, well, so we do actually, we yeah. do both. Yeah. But And you'll hear on the next slide about talking right. to only some people. So, so he's doing a one level of abstraction, saying that I only want to knock on the door and see if somebody is there. And they're going if to- If somebody in the house is if there. none not of as, them are not opening every, it, yep. None of them or, are there, then they're going to basically, you know, nobody's so, going to respond to it. So it's actually interesting. So um, the right analogy here is an apartment building. I go to the apartment building yeah. and I knock on one apartment and I actually take turns knocking on different apartments at different times so that I don't make everybody mad at me because they want to sleep. Ah, oh, that, that's okay. being playing smart. Yeah, like um, you don't want to get people mad, right? right. Yeah, yeah, believe me, you know, okay. because, and I, ugh. Anyway. anyway. So there's a quick question here. Is ping depend oh. on internet speed, so, okay. Oh. Uh, and then no. follow up question <laughs> basically not and trace route so i can i can say a lot more about that but basically i'm just using ping as as proof of existence is this a, is there a computer at this ip address right um oh it's so jayish brought up brings up an excellent point firewalls and nat boxes right so yeah. i say on this slide firewalls block us right and so that's the example if i knock on a door Maybe no one's home, but maybe they just don't want to talk to me and don't come to the door. Yeah, because and that's their choice. They're trying to sell something. They don't want to yeah, open exactly. the door for you, right? Yeah. Um, NAT is a different thing. So NAT is a special thing where rather than appearing on the public internet, you, or you might have one computer on the public internet, but you hide an entire another bunch of computers behind it on the private internet. Um, so. I probe the public internet because that's public. <laughs> I can't probe into NATs because that's private and I'd have to work with the ISPs and you know, not gonna happen. Um, so I don't see into NATs. Um, although I do see the device that's on the public internet. And so in the United States, many people have home routers that are on the public internet and I can see those, but I can't see your laptop behind your home router. And it varies in different countries, right? Um, and we'll look at Indian data in the future. Natting is pretty prevalent in India at ISP level. And so you might not have a public IP address. Um, and that changes things some. But let me push on though, or, or we're going to be uh, long. So, so we probe blocks. 
So the other thing that we try super hard to do is we want to probe politely because I don't want to get fired and I don't want uh, people to complain and people still complain. But so, um, and this also made a big difference because early on we started doing outage detection around 2014 computers and networks are a lot slower. And so initially we worked really, really hard to be able to cover the whole IPv6, uh, the whole IPv4 space every 11 minutes. And we succeeded, but we had to be clever. So, so we don't want to probe any more than we have to. And if you look at what it takes to prove this block is up, um, you actually only need one person to prove that the block's up. Just like if I want to know if an, if an apartment's occupied, I don't have to ask every occupant I just have some have somebody respond at the door. So, um, uh, so I'm going to hold off on the question about private public private IPs because I want to push on a little bit. But we can come back to that. Um, so we probe and then we probe different addresses at different times, and so we actually rotate through the addresses, um, partly to be polite because with that way each address gets less traffic. And actually, partly because that turns out to be key in how we do our COVID detection, but, but I'll come back to that. Now, what you may expect is if you probe an address and it doesn't respond, we want to prove the network's up. So we actually are going to probe more than one address in that case. We're going to probe a couple of addresses. But as soon as the first one replies, we're happy and we are done. And then if we probe several and it's not up, we may abort and decide the block's down. So it's the same idea as I showed you before. It's just we're not always probing everything. We're being adaptive. Okay. So that's how we're polite. And I'd like to think we're very polite. So, um, and there's some science behind this, some Bayesian inference to decide how many to probe and when to stop and all that. I'm not going to say too much more about that. So the system, the probing system is called trinocular. Um, it has three properties. It's principled, precise, and parsimonious. So by principled, I mean the decisions we make are backed by this mathematical um, framework and history that we understand about the block from our prior work. So that we're using, we use that to be parsimonious, meaning we send as little traffic as possible. Um, and we are precise because we are actively probing the internet uh, I can guarantee that we see outages, and I'll show you what each one of these mean really briefly. So this is the principle. We use Bayesian inference. This is the graph of one block, what we believe about it. And I'm not going to go into the details, but the dots represent probes, and red dots are failed probes. And you can see when we get a whole bunch of red dots, we believe the block is down. So um, I think that's, you know, I can say much more about that, but that's the basic idea. Um, and you can see we actually, because of that, get fewer probes. We don't always probe 15 probes every time. Okay, so, and, and there's math behind this. So trust me, math, Greek, exciting. Um, I'm an experimental guy, so this is my experiments. And I'm not going to say too much about this as well, but we had a random, we had a network that was up. We were randomly probing it. Uh, and we compared what we see to what we get, and we can prove that for out, we probe every 11 minutes and we prove that every outage that is at least 11 minutes long, we see. So that's what I mean by pre we're precise. And we're always basically plus or minus around, plus or minus 11 minutes, okay? And the final thing is parsimonious. So this is experimental, eh, experimental data from running our system. This is the fraction of blocks that have a given probe rate per hour. Um, and our target probe rate was background radiation in like 2004, maybe, or something, a long time ago. <laughs> and we were less than 1% of background radiation. So the, the argument is we're, on average, adding very little traffic to the internet. And in fact, there's a lot more junk on the internet today. So um, we're now way in the noise. Um, so that's what I mean by parsimonious. Um, and I'm not going to go into detail here, but it turns out we weren't perfect, as no one is perfect, but we were, we had some problems. The algorithm that is polite does worse in blocks that are very sparse, meaning have very few IP addresses that respond. And so uh, Guillermo Baltra, a student, a current student of mine, 
uh, had some follow-on work where we added an additional algorithm for certain blocks that are harder to measure. And we improved that and are able to handle those correctly now. We actually measure, with his algorithm, we can measure 5 million slash 24s every 11 minutes. Before that, we were doing about 3 to 4 million. So, OK, so that's outage detection. That's the algorithm. Um, and I'm not going to go into detail. Let me show you some of the results from that, though. So I already showed you Hurricane Harvey in Texas. Um, this is another hurricane that hit the coast of Florida. So again, the, the light color is ocean. The black is the Florida Peninsula. Uh, and the green is this hurricane. Uh, there were a lot of outages as the hurricane moved up the peninsula, and we were very happy that 24 hours later, a lot of it was fixed. So you can see that kind of stuff here. Um, uh, we also see operational outages. So uh, a year ago, a little less than a year ago, CenturyLink, which is a large ISP in the United States, had a nationwide outage because their backbone failed. And so for two hours, uh, CenturyLink was down. And so this is the United States before. This is and the, on the left. And on the right is the United States during their outage. And you can see how much of the world, how much of the United States CenturyLink uh, provides internet service for. Um, so we see those kind of big outages as well. And then the final thing I wanted to show is near real-time reporting. So. Um, uh, we have a website, outage.ant.isi.edu, which is data that's about two hours old that we're collecting 24-7. And it's the same kind of visualization as you can see here. Um, my cursor keeps disappearing. But on the right, you can see the visualization. I'm not going to go to it now because we need to pick up some time. But uh, it lets us, you can, you can go see what's happening right now in anywhere in the world from what we see. Okay, so uh, any questions here? Um, ah, yes. So uh, Jayesh's comment about how to find your public IP is is exactly right, and and his recommendation you can go to an internet site that will tell you. So, um, okay. So uh, I want to tell you about two more things before we break and take more questions and stuff. Um, so that's outage detection, and you can go to the website and see what there is to see. And in fact, actually, let me go to the website. There's one thing I wanted to show. Um, oh, and see, I'm going to get in trouble for doing another demo here. Uh, let's go back a few days, so like last Monday. Uh, we actually have... Uh, uh, to find the most interesting outages, we actually have a report. Oh, and it's computing. Uh, sorry, it's a little slow to compute. Um, or maybe it's, I'll let it compute. Um, it's supposed to be cached. So this is why I should have done the demo before the, the thing. But uh, basically what this report is going to do is show us the biggest outages in the internet on this particular day. And you know, if it's going to be slow, I'm going to let it be. So let's go back to our talk and we can come back later. Sorry for that diversion. OK, so I told you about outages. I showed you some pictures of hurricanes and stuff. Um, there's two other things I want to tell you about, uh, clustering and COVID. So we have a lot of data. We've been running outages 24-7 since uh, 2014 or 20 or middle of 2013. Um, we have terabytes of data. And the question is, what do you do with this? How can we get knowledge out of all this raw data? And one thing that is neat is to think about non-geographic visualizations. And so this is a picture of each line is a is a network, and each vertical column is time again. This actually is the Tohoku earthquake that hit in Japan in 2012, so a long time ago. But you can see network outages here that were all in Japan that correspond to undersea cables getting broken and losing internet access. Um, 
which we found out from network operators. Um, but this is the kind of data that I get. So, and this is a tiny, tiny fraction of the data I have. So again, we have time on the x-axis and space on the y-axis. And this is one fourth of one two hundred and twenty fourth of one twelfth of the data that I have, right? So a tiny fraction of data. And you can see how much, how many little dots there are on this screen. And they probably don't even come through very well because of Zoom and stuff. So um, it's really hard to tell what's going on. But you know there's stuff going on because look at all these blobs. Each one of these blobs represents an outage in a network somewhere at a given time. So we're starting to look at automatic clustering algorithms to do this. And you can't take these standard you know, k-means AI algorithms off the shelf because this data is really big. Um, so we actually have two algorithms that I'm not going to tell you because of time today, but I'm going to show you some of the results. And you can go read this paper, if you, this technical report, if you want. Um, but one does visualization and runs in uh, n log n time, which is very fast. The other does clustering and runs in n squared time, which is not as fast as we'd like, but um, clustering is really cool. So I'll, I'll say a little bit about that. But to restate the problem, if we have this data, right? So this is a spatial map of the outages that we saw. How can we rearrange this map to make features appear? So what we do is group each line so, by similarity. So, but you have to then define what do you mean by features, right? What sort of feature do you know? Right. Ahead so of by time? features, I mean outages that happen in common to lots of networks. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I showed you a picture of CenturyLink, if you remember, several slides back, which was an outage that affected, I don't know, 3 million Americans and lots of networks. How do we find out what, who was affected by CenturyLink? Well, I'd like to make CenturyLink all appear together in a cluster. So that's the kind of feature I'm looking for. So yeah, so somebody asked about IPv6. Currently, I'm only doing IPv4. Um, IPv6 is really hard. And ask me again at the end of the talk, and I'll tell you about what we're thinking about there. Um, so that brings up new research problems. That is a new research problem, indeed. Yep. <laughs> um, so the the idea is to get things that are similar to cluster together. So if I take this, if you think about shuffling this, so that the lines that are closest together all are most similar you get this kind of picture. And what you can see if we go back and forth is, like you can see up at the top center, there's this line of a bunch of networks, but it's got these gaps in it, right? So if we recompute it and make the most similar, it turns out most of the line clusters at the bottom here. That's one feature we can see. And it turns out that's the Time Warner outage. Oh, I didn't tell you about Time Warner. I told you about CenturyLink. Time Warner happened a couple of years before CenturyLink. <laughs> so it's an earlier outage we looked at. The other thing you can see is there's these clusters down at the very bottom of this that seem to repeat. Those are actually diurnal behavior where the networks go down every night. And those aren't actually internet failures. Those are people going to sleep. And I'll show you that. That actually has key bearing into our COVID analysis. So anyway, so I'm doing this at a very high level. Um, and I want to move on because it's I could give a whole talk on clustering and, and this. But I wanted to give you a flavor of, I've talked a lot about the science behind outages. Um, there's unanswered questions, science questions, and clustering is one I'm currently working on. So, um, so the, my big goal with clustering, though, is to discover dependencies. So like, could I tell you everyone who's behind the CenturyLink internet? Or could I tell you everyone who's behind the Chinese Great Firewall? And those are questions I think I can answer. Um, and in fact, the CenturyLink thing, I'm sorry, the, the Time Warner outage, I can see visualized here. And uh, I'm not going to go into details. Oops, that's too far. But if we cluster on just the outages that happened on the three days around the Time Warner outage, we get these very clear clusters. And that's, I believe, is exactly the networks behind Time Warner, which is kind of cool to figure that out from just a bunch of pings. <laughs> so, but what I really wanna to get to is COVID because we're all still affected by COVID. Um, and I, and I wanna wrap up without running too long. 
So what do we know about COVID? Well, one reaction, the only reaction for the first year of COVID was don't talk to anybody, <laughs> stay away, <laughs> right? And work from home. And different countries did this in different ways. But in the United States, there was a lot of controversy about, do, should we stay at home? Should we be able to go out and do things? And, and I think that was in a lot of countries. Um, and so the question we had is, could we detect people staying at home through our internet data? And the answer is, yes, I think we can. And I want to tell you how. So um, let me tell you how we do this. So what we're going to do if we take this plot you saw before, I'm going to count how many addresses we see over time. So right, there's three green dots on the first time, two on the second, four, and then three. So each of those dots represent a computer or an IP address, I should say. And we can see they come and go over time. So does this mean anything? Well, yes, it does. It turns out we can see the internet go to sleep. And we published a paper on this in 2014, and I'm going to show you the video if I can. Uh, let's, let's see. So, um, This is the video we made from that. I'm going to skip ahead. So in this picture, blue and red don't mean responsive or non-responsive. Instead, yellow is at the norm. And then red is above average and blue is below average. And the norm is the normal amount of responsiveness in that geographic grid cell. So in this case, it's a two by two degree uh, region. Okay, so the other thing you can see here is we have the day-night diurnal uh, cycle. So you can see there's a slightly darker and slightly lighter spot. Um, and so let's play this and I'll talk about it as we go. And I realize it's, oh no, I'm going to pause it because it's horrible over Zoom. So I've paused it for a moment. And what you can see right now, if we look at India, is it's uh, dawn because you can see that the Terminator is just cutting through India. And we can see that India is blue, which means that there are fewer IP addresses in India that respond to our pings than normal. About, you know, we can look at the scale, maybe 12% or something. And then if I run it later, now we see it's noon in India and now India is white. And if I let it go a little further, now it's afternoon and now India is red. So now India is at like plus 16%. So what does this mean? Well, it means there's more internet in the India during the day. In other words, more IP addresses respond to our pings during daylight hours in India than at nighttime hours or early morning hours. And in fact, we can see when people go to sleep because you know now it's midnight and you're back to normal, right? So people stay up late. I guess it's cooler at night. Um, and you know it only goes blue early in the morning, okay? So this is kind of fun, and although the animation is awful, you can go so to my website. So that basically means that uh, people turn their computers off potentially at night. Yes. You know, the, so our the implication public is facing one, obviously. People are know. turning off public-facing IPs. Mm -hmm. Now it's a little more complicated than this for some of the questions that we saw, right? Because um, so India's ISPs are are complicated. <laughs> Lots of people are behind NAT boxes. Um, and I don't know for certain exactly what we're seeing in India here, because um, I don't know if we're seeing, I know in the United States, we see a lot of home routers. Um, I don't know in India, are we seeing a lot of cell phones that get shut off or get that drop their internet connections in the day, in the nighttime? Um, so, you know, that's something where, where folks on the call might, might help us in the future. Um, but we do know the, the absolute truth is the number of ping responsive addresses changes at night. Um, and we can we verified this and we'll see this in a minute about COVID, um, some other stuff. So anyway, but uh, the animation looks horrible on Zoom, but I encourage you to go to the website and you can watch it much nicer directly streaming to you 
So there's a comment there from Josh again that, you know, because your video is from 2013. Oh. And that's pre-WhatsApp world in India, right? So, or everywhere. And uh, now oh, you think nobody, now nobody turns their internet off? <laughs> yeah, they're doing a WhatsApp well, all the time. I, I get the WhatsApp thing. Um, uh, yeah, so it's, you know, actually understanding what happens in today's complex networks is complicated. Um, your phone is trying really hard to shut its internet connection off because it keeps it takes a lot of energy to keep a 4G connection up. So even with WhatsApp, um, there's a low power mode where it may give up on its pub, on its uh, ISP connection, its high speed ISP connection. But but yeah, we could have a much longer conversation about this. Let me let me push on for right now. But um, yes, um, okay. So that was kind of fun, and and we did that just because boy, it's cool to look at the the world. What I want to add there, John, what you oh, just sure. said is that, you know, the, uh, for, for the audience really that, mm -hmm. you know, John really does cool stuff. And what's beauty about the problem John looks at is nothing remains static. You know, as, <laughs> Joyce, as Joyce brings it up, you know, what about, you know, people using more WhatsApp and stuff like that? Look, then you have to change something either in the algorithm or in way you collect the data so that your accuracy is as good as you can get, right? So that you, that's your goal. And there, that's where, for example, as John just mentioned that about that, you know, because it's very power hungry, they, they will shut you down. So, you, you know, you might think you are connected, but at a different time or granularity or information, your phone is not actually fully connected. So that, you know, you can ping it and get, realize that you know, it's not responding or whatever it is, you know, so yeah, so you can get uh, some traces of it, but you, it's important to understand other dynamics also in this problem context. Yeah, there's a That's lot of it. interactions and, and um, especially when we get into the mobile internet and stuff. Oh, so Mohit asked about geolocation. So we use a public data uh, um, MaxMind, uh, which is a free, freely available uh, data source of geolocation that maps IPv4 to, to physical locations. It's not perfect by any means, but for drawing continent level things, it's, it's certainly adequate. Um, good question. Um, okay, so, so I told you about the internet sleeping, but I have to get to COVID before we end. So you, you have to let me push on. So our insight from work from home is um, if we could see people sleep, maybe we can see people stay at home. And this is very tricky to do. We weren't completely sure we could do it, but, uh, but I'll show you some data that shows we can. The secret is, the challenge is, um, a lot of the internet doesn't change, right? Even though in India we saw big swings, um, in the United States especially, uh, uh, a lot of people have modems on their, at their homes that are always on and never change, right? So um, if your modem is never always on, we can't see if you're at home or work, but, but if you're using a dynamic connection, we perhaps can. So what we do is we look for what we call change sensitive blocks and that's blocks where they do change day and night. Um, and we see that there's about 200,000 of those that we can find. And then we look for changes in those change sensitive blocks. So let me show you a picture to make this a little more clear, right? So the graph at the top here shows the number of IP addresses in one block. And you can see all these bumps. So the X axis is time as usual. And this is actually, I think three months of data. And so you can see each bump, there are five bumps in each little group. That's because we work five days a week. And in fact, you can see that in some of these clusters, there's only four bumps because the United States has a holiday in January and a holiday in February. And those correspond to the four week, uh, four bumps right here, and then the four bumps right here. And this was data for the United States. Um, and the final thing, this is 2020. So you can see what happens here. Well, that's when we started staying home in, in California. This is a California block, in fact. So the bumps we know based on talking with network operators in this case are exactly people's laptops connecting to this particular network. And you can see exactly when they stayed home, <laughs> which is pretty cool. So the research project's goal was 
how do we find blocks that look like this? It's over here on my screen. How do we find blocks that look like this? And then how do we detect changes in them? And so uh, we have an algorithm that detects changes. It's called CSUM. It's a standard algorithm. Uh, you can see that there's a change detected for this block. And we've applied that to our data, which takes this data that we collected to measure outages and gives us a wholly different result through a wholly different algorithm. So, and if you remember, I was talking about how clever we were to only probe a few addresses. It turns out that comes back and bites us here because here we want to probe all the addresses, but we were able to work through that. So that's the, that's the high level idea of how we detect work from home. We look for work week changes, and then we look for things that no longer show that kind of change. Okay. So let me show you some data from that. So this is Wuhan in January. Uh, the graph on the right is the graph of the percentage of blocks that are down in a particular grid cell. And I think these are also two degree by two degree. Um, the colors are the, this color scale. Uh, here it's percentage down from zero to 30% on the, and things don't go red in this graph, but they go like white, which means like 15% down. And you can actually see Wuhan went 5% down. It's a big city. It didn't change that much, even though they were in lockdown. Okay. So this is Wuhan. We expected Wuhan to shut down because it was public and, and we knew about it. We went and looked for it. We found it. Um, something we didn't know about, we were looking through our data and looking for big spikes. This is the Philippines. And we could see lockdown in the Philippines was on March 12th. And we had a big spike on March like 13th or 14th. And there's a little bit of lag in our data. So um, we think we saw what happened in the Philippines. And here it's like 25% of the networks in this particular grid cell. And this gets me to the final thing, which you've been so patient to wait for. Um, we looked at India because India had some big spikes. And we actually saw two things in India. We see a spike in Jan uh, March 1st, and we see another spike March 16th or 18th. What did I say? 22nd. And when we looked That's at the from news, last year, 2020, that, this is both from last year. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So when we looked at the news, there was a citizenship law that was passed at the end of February, which you are more familiar with than I am. But our understanding is there were protests over that. And there were curfews in, um, uh, oh, goodness, Agaria, Agar, Agar, um, which is just west. Aligar. Oh. Right, right. Aligar. Oh, thank and that's, you. Yeah, the CAA is the Citizenship you know, Amendment Act. That's what CAA is, right? Correct. Ah, thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. So Aligar is just west of Delhi, right? So, um, and you could see in our data uh, on this particular day, it went white. So they had a lot of network outages there. And we believe that's evidence of the internet shutdown and stay at home curfews that, that, um, that were in effect then. And then I think in March was the, there's a word for it, uh, the Janata curfew, um, which was when India first locked down for COVID and there's an even bigger spike on that event. So uh, uh, India shows diurnal effects you saw in the animation and we could see these kind of effects of these uh, social events on the internet responsiveness. So um, that I think is neat to be able to see that in real data, um, in internet data, see those real effects in internet data. Um, so the work at uh, the work from home study, the COVID detection is still work in progress. Um, I have a tech report out that you can look at. Um, and if you have more questions about that, you should talk to me. We actually have a little bit more information than this um, in progress, but I wanted to give you a flavor of that because you know COVID is still very much on everybody's minds. Um, and just to wrap up, um, we're still, there's a lot to do in the algorithms, right? We didn't expect COVID, to, nobody expected COVID, um, but uh, it was neat that uh, we were able to reanalyze this data to understand something about COVID. But we actually think there's other things we can study too. Um, IPv6 came up earlier, so I'm not gonna say much about that here. Other than to say two to the 128 is much, bigger than two to the 32. We can scan two to the 32 in 11 minutes if we want without a problem, the whole thing, all of it, 
if we wanted to. It would make people mad if we did that every 11 minutes, but it's possible. Uh, you could not scan two to the 128 in the lifetime of the universe with today's networking technology. So um, I'm really excited by what that means because it means we have to do more research to figure out how to handle IPv6. And we're, we've started to look at that. And I have some ideas, but that's not this talk. Um, and the other real question is, you know, is this, we make our data publicly available. Um, it's all work sponsored by US NSF and DHS and other parts of the US. So I'm, as a scientist, I'm able to make my data available. So if anybody wants to analyze this data, uh, talk to me and I'm happy to make use of it. And maybe you can tell me more about what happens to networks in India because you can actually ask your friends. Um, and I ask my friends too, but but uh, it's always harder when you're far away. Um, and so that's what I wanted to say. So um, it's really exciting to measure the whole internet every 11 minutes. Uh, and it's even more exciting to learn what that teaches us about our world. Um, uh, so uh, I guess at that point, uh, I should, I should uh, take questions. So Mohit has a question about mass scan. So mass scan is a tool that followed on to our work. Uh, mass scan uh, had the goal of scanning as quickly as possible. Um, we scan pretty darn quickly, uh, but that's never been our goal because um, uh, I like to not make people mad at me. Um, and so we try really hard to be polite, um, but uh, I think our scan rate is, when we measured it in 2014, it was 6,000 probes. Uh, a second per core, and you can paralyze this arbitrarily. So, you know, you can go as fast as you want. And mass scan is cool. The other big one is um, uh, ZMAP is the other big open source scanning tool that people use. Um, I will say one thing though, when they go fast, a lot of times they lose some of the information. So part of the reason, the other reason we don't go absolutely as fast as we can is we keep track of every probe we send and we record what we probed and didn't get responses for. Um, and we use that information in our analysis that, to do outages and stuff. So um, good, any other questions or any comments or any ideas about Indian networks and what I'm seeing? Great. Uh, let me see if somebody asks a question. So while we wait for more questions on the chat, uh, John, I mean, this is very enlightening. I mean, what I want to point out about, uh, and one more thing about John is that John is looking at the internet as a science, basically. Mm -hmm. You know, basically look at what is happening, how internet is progressing over time, you know, and as you try to understand it, what's going on, you need to have a different methods and mechanism to do it. And not only that, uh, from a data collection point of view, you are collecting so much of 45 terabytes, I think at one point you said. Oh, 45 like. terabytes so yeah. far. And, and, that's sitting in John's basement or wherever it is, right? Uh, you know, so that, but he brought up another very important uh, point at one point. Many of you hear about machine learning, uh, uh, you know, as a, or AI as a common thing. He found out that, you know, the standard machine learning or AI technique doesn't work for what he wants to be able to understand, which means there are new methods can be developed even on fields like that because you know, the standards you know, ones don't apply. Correct me, John, if I miss something on mm -hmm. that. No, no, this is all good. Yeah, so that's, that's sort of what it is. And so again, John is uh, you know, a very open, you know, open person. He's, he's going to answer your email and everything. And so, and yeah, uh, oh. you, know, you can ask him question. And if you so, want to study some data or whatever, you can always uh, contact him, so. So let's see if anybody else have any questions. And if so, it is uh, here, you can uh, unmute yourself now and ask a question. We can hang around for another maybe five minutes or so. Sure, maybe. sure. Yeah. So there's my email address if you have any questions post-conference. Um, and yeah. I wanted to add one thing to what you said, Deep. So, I mean, I'm, a, I'm both an engineer and a scientist. Um, I, I'm an engineer because I like to build stuff and, and help make new things. But I'm also a scientist because to build these things, you have to think hard about what you're measuring and what it means and stuff. And so um, I, uh, I skimmed over parts of the talk because I, otherwise we'd be here all night. But it takes a lot of care to back up 
um, some of the claims I made, like we guarantee we see all outages that last 11 minutes. Um, and uh, to back that up with scientific evidence and proofs. And that's really important. And in fact, my, my early outage paper, the China Code paper got rejected a whole bunch of times. And a lot of the reviewers had the knee-jerk reaction. Oh, we know everybody blocks pings. This will never work. And we actually had to work very hard to demonstrate the validity of our approach. And um, that was one comment I wanted to make. The other comment um, is also about science, but it's about the importance of open science. So one of the thing and open data, and so we've always made our data publicly available or available at no cost. You have to fill out a form to get it. But um, one of the things I mentioned in passing is that, oh, by the way, there's these blocks that we don't work very well on. And I had a, a student, Guillermo Balcher, who went off and fixed that with this additional algorithm. And I didn't really have time, so I skimmed over the algorithm. But we actually found out about that problem because some other researchers took our data, implemented their own algorithm with their own data, uh, and then validated their data against our data. And, and they were very happy because they found a bunch of our errors. <laughs> um, and we were happy too, because uh, although they were happy to brag about the errors that they found, we were happy that actually the vast majority of our data held up to their scrutiny and their, their independent analysis. Um, and they did find some errors and we went and fixed them. And our work is stronger because of that back and forth. And, and so, um, you know, open, so scientific method and open data is really important um, uh, to moving the world forward. So anyway. Great, that's very good. That's a very uh, important point you made, John, about what it thanks. is, you know, in some sense, it seems like it's a work in progress, you know, so, but, well, you know. Science but, is always a work in progress. Well, science is always a work in progress. Uh, anybody have any question? You can unmute yourself and then, you know. Uh, um, oh yeah, Mohit asks about the Great Firewall. Um, in the middle of my talk, so specifically, um, when I was talking about clustering, uh, one of the applications of clustering is to figure stuff out about the internet. And one of the things we can figure out is, um, I went over it really fast, so, but the fact that Time Warner had an outage and that it shows up as this vertical line in our data uh, allows us to use our data to discover what blocks failed in the Time Warner outage and therefore what blocks are behind Time Warner's routers. So we have done the same thing with China because it turns out we've seen outages in China that seem to affect all of China. And in fact, I don't think there are outages because people would notice if China went off the net and China's very big and it has a very rich connectivity. But I do think we have data that shows that they turned on blocking pings on the firewall. Um, and so uh, discovering what's behind the Great Firewall is something that people would be interested in that not completely easy to figure out. Mm -hmm. So um, that's sort of what I was getting on that. So, but that's very much work in progress. And um, so, you know, come back and maybe I'll, oops, um, maybe I can say more about that next year, so. Great, all right, great, thank you. If uh, and nobody else have any questions, um, Sieda has a comment. I guess yeah, about Wi-Fi connection on on yeah. his or her cell phone. Um, uh, so yeah, that that uh, intermittent connectivity and wireless is actually another big important research area, and um, that's probably another talk as well. So um, may, I'm not going to try to delve into that right now, but. But maybe we could talk, maybe you could send me an email and we could swap mail about that. So great. Um, anyway, otherwise, I think we're set. Is yep, it? great. Okay. Thank you so well, much. Thank you very much, Deep. Yep. And I hope you guys have a good afternoon. Uh, yep. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Okay. Talk thank to you.